Uh, I tried to convince you today of uh, what I think is uh, one of the challenges. We heard a lot about, you know, subcellular uh, uh, challenges already. But uh, I would uh, try to make the point that a cell, you know, is embedded into something and it's doing something within uh, the context of what's happening in the environment. So I try to show you a way how we may actually be able to map behavior or sensory perception on the individual cell lab, uh, level and even onto individual synapses. And let me, so is this video actually working? Yeah. So let me just uh, define what I think is kind of a roadmap here. So the simulation, the, so the goal would be to simulate the sensory evoked signal flow of these individual neurons, the virtual cells, so to speak, during behavior and embed these individual neuron models into the network structure. Um, and so one, okay. Uh, so one thing to, that has to be done first is to kind of quantitatively describe a behavior and to define what is kind of the sensory input that's driving this behavior, to identify then the structures, the brain structures that are involved in processing the sensory information, to classify all the individual neurons structurally and functionally, uh, functionally within these networks and basically rebuild or reverse engineer this network, embed individual neurons into these networks to identify anatomical pathways, the inputs these cells are getting, and to f uh, equally important define what synapses are actually active during what kind of stimulus, during what kind of behavioral state. And the example system where we are uh, uh, going to show you how this may be achieved is the rodent uh, whisker system. And what is so nice about the rodent whisker system is that there is a kind of a somatotopic relationship between an individual whisker on the animal's snout and a segregated structure in the sensory cortex called a barrel column. So you can think of that these individuals, uh, an individual whisker is kind of represented by an individual barrel column here in the sensory cortex, and neighboring barrel columns reflect neighboring whiskers on the animal's snout. So in terms of behavior, so what can these animals do with uh, their whiskers? So what you see here is a so-called gap cross experiment. The animal is trying to reach over and detect the other side of the gap. And if we increase the gap side so it cannot reach over, the animal will actually refuse to do the gap cross. So if we do this, so this is the gap uh, is increased now, it cannot do this. So the decision making based here is basically triggered on the input from the single whisker. So if we do a top view with a high speed camera here, so on the bottom you see the gap, and we only left a single whisker here, so you see that kind of the decision making process seems to be a combination of an exploratory behavior of moving the whiskers actively back and forth and touching the other side of the gap. So the question here is, what is an individual cell, or what are these cells in the networks, the synapses doing when the animal is moving its whiskers and when it's touching something? So can we map the sensory stimulus and signal flow evoked by the sensory input onto the individual cell and network level? And the way how we probe these individual neurons in the network is by doing single cell recordings in the living animal. So we record the electrical activity in vivo from individual neurons in these cortex areas I, I told you, and can thus map you know, what is a single cell doing in response to if we touch the whisker, if the animal is moving its whiskers, if the animal is actively touching an object, and so forth. But in addition to this functional information, we also label these individual neurons with a dye and reconstruct the full, complete 3D morphology of these cells. So the dendrites, the axons, and the anatomical reference structures so that we are able to look at, you know, what is the cell like, where it's located, what kind of input it may get. And we use this to do what we refer to as reverse engineering the rodent whisker system. So what you're seeing here is a high resolution uh, 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 data set of basically the entire rodent brain, so, so that what you see here in red are individual neuron somata, in green inhibitory somata, and if we do a virtual slice tangentially to the, uh, to the whisker cortex as is shown here, and rotate it so that we have kind of a top view onto the cortical surface, you already see these barrel columns emerging here. And one way, or one kind of preliminary step to quantify uh, how we reconstruct these, these networks is basically to figure out how variable is the system from one animal to the next. So in other words, how stereotypic is the geometry of the system? And what you see here is kind of the average barrel column uh, from many different animals.
and, we, and the color here refers to individual whisker rows on the animal's snout. And what we found here is that actually the variability in terms of cortex geometry is very, very small across animals, so in the order of 30 micrometers. So we can say with about 30 micrometer precision, we can take our individual recorded neuron and put it into the average model. So the next question, of course, is how many cells are there? So we developed tools to automatically kind of detect all these red neurons. You see here the red and the green neurons, so that we get an estimate of how many cells uh, uh, are there in, uh, associated with each individual column, with different columns and uh, barrel columns and so forth. So what you see here is basically a measurement of the number and 3D distribution of all the neurons in this cortex. So we're looking at roughly about half a million, half a million of neurons here, and the variability between one animal and the next is actually also very small. So what we end up with is a kind of a highly precise three-dimensional reference frame of the entire cortex and the number of cells and their distribution within this cortex. So since we do this recordings with about 30 micrometer precision and do this for many animals, we can now start replacing each individual soma here by a recorded and reconstructed neuron, which is shown here on the example of a layer five cell in blue is the exon and red is the dendrite of this cell and you see the exon leaving the, the white matter down leaving the white matter down there and we, as i said we do this for many cells so each of these dots represents a different neuron here and there are various types you know uh, this would be for instance a spiny stellate in layer four a layer three neuron a layer six neuron and so forth, and progressively all these neurons are replaced by a reconstructed neuron that has been found at approximately the same location, is color-coded, is uh, based on different cell types, so we scale up here so you see a lot of empty space, but it's, it's a visualization issue, so it's only roughly about half a percent of all the cells are, pl uh, are shown here for this particular cortex. So we actually can now zoom in on the, on the individual uh, cell level again. And as I said, we're only showing the dendrites here, but the axons uh, of the cell are also present. So if we go to our example cell here at high resolution, we can actually start estimating the synaptic contacts this cell is getting from all these other cells surrounding it which is shown here now. So you see this individual cell, it receives about 20,000 uh, synapses from all these uh, uh, cells uh, surrounding it. But since we know the function of all these presynaptic cell types, how they respond to different signals, we can color code what these sy synapses are actually doing. So in green, for instance, would be synapses that are active when the animal is actively moving its whiskers. In blue are synapses that would be active when the animal is touching something. So, and we can now look where are these synapses located, and as you can see, the location of these synapses is not randomly kind of distributed uh, around these cells, so they're abundant in the apical tuft, and for instance, the touch synapses are not located in the tuft and are not as frequent as in the cell, uh, in the basal dendrites. So now we can actually do simulations of this. So we simulate here what is happening if the animal is actually touching something. So the touch synapses are active, and we see this cell in the context of this network, in the context of touching something with its whisker, will be spiking. The situation changes if we now look, the animal is not touching anything, but just moving its whiskers. It's the same cell, but as you can see, it will not start spiking based on the simulation, but the subthreshold activity in this cell is still very important since it's kind of, all these kind of flickering in the apical tuft reflect different locations of the, uh, uh, of the whisker in 3D space. So what I tried to convince you while my affiliations and, and, and partners and people that con contributed are coming up is that the individual cell can do actually and perform a lot of different things based on the kind of behavioral context the animal is actually, what the animal is actually doing. So only identifying, you know, the subcellular mechanisms or even all the connections the cell is receiving won't be able, uh, we won't be able to figure out what these cells are actually doing. So we have to identify the signal and sensory evoked processing streams uh, to identify what a single cell is actually capable of doing and how these situations change when the animal's behavioral state is changing. Thanks.